With chameleon keeping, as with everything, uh, there's an easy way to do it and the hard way to do it. Unfortunately, when you're first starting out, you don't know which is the easy way and which is the hard way. Well, I've been doing chameleon keeping for over 40 years, and I've learned a little bit about what the easy way is and definitely what the hard way is. In today's podcast, I'm going to be talking about uh, different decisions that need to be made at milestones in the chameleon keeper's life. And I'm going to be using those 40 plus years of experience to let you know which is the easy way to success. Hello, Chameleon Wranglers. My name is Bill Strand, and today we're going to be talking about the easy way to do things. There are a number of milestone decisions in a Chameleon Keeper's journey, and the decisions you make at those points can lead you to a path that's a lot of fun or a path that's a little bit harder. Now, what is the significance of doing it the easy way or the hard way, and why am I bother making a podcast on this? And the answer is that when we talk about strengthening the chameleon community, the people that are able to strengthen the community are the ones that are here for a while. Uh, there's a learning curve that happens when you first get into chameleons. And if you can get over that learning curve, then you are able to help other people get over that learning curve. That's, that's our beginner's learning curve. And the more people that can help the people in that position the stronger our community gets. And so for those of us who look at the community as something to be nurtured, it's important to help people pass these initial challenges. And as I said, the more people that pass those challenges, the more people we have within the community that can help other people pass those challenges. And so the purpose of this episode is to give you insight into some of the most common decision points that people go through. So when you get to that point in your journey, you'll have some insight as to what your options are. So let's start at the very beginning. You're deciding what chameleon to get. And there's so many options out there. There's different species. There's male and a female. There's wild caught. There's captive bred. Uh, pe some people are selling eggs. Then you can go to a pet store. You can go to a breeder. I It can be very confusing. Or it can be like a candy shop and you just go in and start picking whatever looks good. Now, it may be no surprise that that's not the best way to make the decision. And, uh, and it's true. So let's go ahead and talk about what chameleon you should get. And with all of those decisions, there's really only one way that stands out as the best way to get started with chameleons. And uh, I, anybody who's listened to my podcast any length of time can probably say this in unison with me, is a well-started, captive-hatched, juvenile chameleon from a reputable breeder. And the reason why that is the one choice above all others is that is the most reliable way that you can get a healthy chameleon that you can grow with. And a huge advantage of going with a reputable breeder is that if you buy from a pet store or a show or online classifieds, the financial transaction is the end of your relationship with the person who's selling you the chameleon. If you go with a reputable breeder, the financial transaction where you are buying the chameleon is actually the beginning of the relationship that you're going to have with that breeder because that breeder wants you to be successful. And so that breeder is going to be available to you to ask questions, whether it's one week, three months, six months, or a year later. I know you can find information on care, all sorts of places, especially on the chameleonacademy.com website. But it always helps to talk to someone who is familiar with your personal situation. They know the chameleon, the chameleon's lineage, and they were with the chameleon for three months. So having a breeder to work with is a powerful tool for your success. Wild-caught chameleons need acclimation. Pet store chameleons may or may not have gotten the best care. Getting an egg means you're dealing with a hatchling, which is the most fragile stage of a chameleon's life. And finding them on online classifieds, you have no idea what you're going to get. Yes, you get them for a cheaper price, but you will hear over and over again and something to just go ahead and write in stone. Don't shop on price when you're shopping for animals. When you're getting your first chameleon, shop on 
quality. And you're saying, well, wait a minute, I'm a beginner. How do I know what quality is? Yes, you are going to have to do a little bit of research, and I'm going to do my best to make that easy for you on chameleonacademy.com. If you go to the show notes for this episode, I'm going to link you to another podcast episode that talks about how to find a reputable breeder. I know it takes a little bit of work to do that, and I know it's a whole lot easier to fall in love with some marketing shot of a panther chameleon with all of its bright colors, but you will not regret putting the time into finding a good breeder. So your first decision as to which chameleon to get the easy way is to get a well-started, captive-hatched juvenile from a reputable breeder. The second milestone that people run into is getting involved with the chameleon community. Now, that can be before or after the sale, but once you step into these digital halls, you are in for a whirlwind. There are so many different groups and there are so many different opinions and you have court politics and drama all over the place, just like you do anytime you get humans together. And so, the easy way to deal with all of this is to not take sides. Make a decision that you are going to try out different groups to see which one uh, fits you the best. But here's what I want you to do. Don't take sides. I know people latch on to the first person that sounds like they know what they're talking about and is nice to you. And what happens is people uh, pledge their allegiance and uh, will fight any battle uh, for the honor of this person that was nice to you. Well, the chameleon community, it, it's not a gang. It's not the Yakuza. You don't have to pledge your loyalty to any one person. And this is what I'm going to uh, suggest to you is that you come into the community. Yes, you find the first person that you want to talk to and you develop that digital relationship with a certain group, but don't take on any drama or any enemies or when you are told this person doesn't know what they're talking about, just sit back and listen to everything that's going on and don't take sides. As soon as you have more time and experience under your belt, you'll be in a better position to decide which husbandry philosophies you want to go with. But don't burn your bridges before you get to that point. I see so many people, they find a random group, they soak up all the information from that group, and then they decide that any other information is wrong, evil, and they'll fight against it. And these people essentially are stunted. They have chosen a group because they just happen to stumble on that group. Allow yourself to stumble into groups, but don't pledge loyalty to the point where you're burning bridges with other groups and other thoughts until you know exactly what you are embracing and what you are rejecting. So the easy way when you come to the point of deciding which community to hang out in is to quietly listen. Be gracious to everyone around you and don't take sides. Okay, so you have your chameleon, you've got your husbandry, and you are having a grand old time. Things are starting to come a little bit easier. Where is the next milestone that comes? Often, it comes in the form of someone saying, hey, one chameleon is incredible, two would be doubly incredible. And so people start thinking about getting another chameleon. And oh my goodness, there is an easy way and there is a hard way with this one. Although different species of chameleons seem to have a cage that looks very similar, uh, they do have special requirements. For example, if you start with a panther chameleon and then you decide to bring in a Jackson's chameleon, you're going to have to learn a little bit more of some specialized husbandry. In this case, a, a nighttime drop and a maximum for temperature. And so the easy way, if you want to add a chameleon to uh, your existing one, is to get a species or an individual that has the same husbandry requirements. And since I don't know which chameleon you have, you're going to have to do the research to figure out what other species have those same requirements. And so, for example, many of you start off with panther chameleons. And if you are wondering what to start off with, I would suggest starting off with a panther chameleon uh, with the bright colors and the, it's hardy and it's uh, readily available as a captive hatch. I, it's essentially the perfect pet chameleon. So let's just, for example, say you have a panther chameleon. A logical choice would be to get another panther chameleon. Now, the really cool thing about panther chameleons is with so many locales and uh, color patterns, 
you could have an incredibly fascinating lifetime journey just getting the different locales of panther chameleons. And the advantage to that, of course, is that the other panther chameleon is going to take the exact same care as the one you already have. Now, be cautious about making that decision as to whether to get a male or a female. If you get one of the opposite sex from the one you have already, you very well may be tempted to breed chameleons. And that is a huge step that we're going to be talking about very soon. Now, what happens if you have a panther chameleon, but you really like Jackson's chameleons? Well, panther chameleons are comfortable in warmer temperatures, whereas Jackson's chameleons need a nighttime drop to uh, the upper 50s or low 60s, and you can't have them over 80 degrees or else they start getting heat stress. And for most people, that requires air conditioning in the room. But now you are relegating your panther chameleon, if it's in the same room, to those conditions. And you can see how it gets challenging having different species of chameleons because it's a lot easier to have them in separate rooms. And so just uh, be ready for that and be ready to give each chameleon what they need. And that, that's the way I have it. I have three different areas that have chameleons and one is the warmer area and one is the air conditioned area. And the other one is, well, actually for larger chameleons. But if you have one room and one set of conditions that are really working for whatever species you have, I highly recommend getting another species that has the exact same care requirements as the one that you have shown that you are doing excellently with. And that would be the easy way to do it. And now we get to a substantial milestone in your chameleon keeping life. And that is the point where you decide, huh, it might be fun to breed chameleons. And I will tell you right now that it is fun to breed chameleons. In fact, it's one of the most enjoyable things in my life. I love raising up baby chameleons. But this is one of those decisions where there's a lot of hard ways that people fall into because they get too enthusiastic. So let me lay down a foundation. In most of the common chameleons, it's not a challenge at all to breed the chameleon, as in have them mate. It's not necessarily a challenge to incubate the eggs. Uh, and it's not really much of a challenge to get them to hatch. The huge challenge when it comes to uh, breeding and uh, reproducing chameleons is that the babies need to be raised separately. And so one of the first things you decide when you want to start breeding is how many females are you going to get? And I know it seems obvious, well, you just get one, right? Well, maybe. Some people get enthusiastic and they start with three. Well, let me tell you, say we go with panther chameleons. Three panther chameleon females, 20 to 30 eggs each. And by the way, after they mate, they can double clutch and give another clutch very soon after. And so you could potentially get up to 60 eggs per female, and that would be 180 eggs sitting in your incubator. As very cool as that sounds, uh, they will hatch one day. And when they hatch, that is when your race starts. Can you take care of 180 babies? Oh, but they were laid months apart. Yeah, well, eggs sometimes tend to sink together because they're looking for signals from the outside world to tell them when to hatch. That's what they do in the wild. And so if you confuse them with artificial signals, uh, you don't know what's going on inside that egg. And they may all take these signals that are coming around them and they may synchronize to hatch right around the same time. And so the first thing that I would suggest to make this an easy breeding experience is to start with one female. And honestly, it's more than a suggestion. It's a warning. Start with one female. We have so many breeders that get so excited about breeding because it's so cool. And when they get their first clutches, they absolutely burn out. And it's a complete heartbreaking disaster when you burn out because there's too many babies. You can't feed them all. They start fighting. They start biting each other. It's a nightmare situation. And so I would like to warn you, start off very slow. One female, one clutch if possible. You may get two whether you try it or not. But this is not only a milestone 
it's a landmine. So go into breeding very carefully. The second decision about breeding that will dictate whether you are happy or miserable is what genetics you use for breeding. I know when you look out there, you may be saying, oh, that is very expensive. Why would I buy a female for $400, $500 when I could get one for $200? Yes, it makes perfect financial sense now, but it's going to be a disaster 12, 14 months from now because you're going to be putting an enormous amount of money into the infrastructure and feeding all of these babies. And you are going to be putting that money in whether you are breeding and raising uh, the best genetics possible or the unknown genetics because you got it from a pet store because it was cheaper. I will tell you when you get to the point where you are trying to find new homes of people that will buy your babies, if you have great lineage, it's a lot easier to sell those babies. If you don't know the lineage, it is incredibly difficult to sell those babies. And in fact, you probably end up having to sell them wholesale to the pet store who is going to sell it to the next breeder who decides that they are going to take the hard way. So it is worth it to spend the extra $300 up front to make sure you get a female of known lineage or a male that looks absolutely drop dead gorgeous. I know it's an extra investment up front, but let me tell you, when you are trying to sell those babies, you will thank yourself for making that investment. And the third thing I'm going to say about the breeding experience and making sure you make the right decisions with that is raise the babies individually. Yes, I know you have seen a number of breeders, especially old time breeders. They show you this bin of babies and how they're taking care of the bin of babies and how they tell you, oh, you just have to separate out the bullies. I will tell you, you are going to be miserable if you try to raise them up in a bin. And the reason is, is because chameleon babies don't like to be around each other. And so they stress each other. They have dominance battles with each other. And you don't necessarily see this. I mean, babies will do passive aggressive or semi-passive aggressive things like they'll zap a fruit fly that they saw that a smaller one wanted to eat. And so they'll actually take food that someone else wanted to eat. This is to establish dominance. They're saying, I am in charge of this bush. You go to another bush. But the problem is when you have them together, they can't go to another bush. And so the smaller ones don't eat as much. They don't grow as fast. The larger ones uh, have stress as well because they're always trying to maintain their dominance. And so you end up with some A grade and then there's B grade that may have bite marks. They may have uh, tail nipped, but uh, they will grow slower because they're under this stress. Now, just the welfare of the animal should be enough to justify going through the uh, effort of creating individual cages for each chameleon. It's what's best for the babies. And I know it's done a lot. You're going to see it a lot and it's defended. But the only reason that that's defended is because people want more chameleons than they have space for. Yes, you can build the skills to make it work, but it's a compromise. And if the animal welfare argument isn't enough, I can just go to the marketing argument. It takes skill and experience to know how to separate out all the babies, the ones that are bigger, the ones that are bullying. And if you don't have that experience, well, your chameleons are going to be suffering. As a first time breeder, by definition, you don't have that experience. And so what happens is that you start seeing some of your chameleons not grow as fast and they just sit in the corner. They may have bite marks on them by the time you try to sell them. And if we're going to the business reason, you want them to grow as fast as possible so you can sell them. And the reason why you are breeding chameleons in the first place is because you enjoy it. And so I think it's important that you make sure that it will be an enjoyable experience and you remove these potential disasters before you go through them. And so even though breeding is not easy, there's nothing about it that is easy, there are decisions that you can make that will make it easier and more enjoyable. And that would be start slow, get the absolute best genetics you can, and prepare ahead of time to raise each baby individually. And going over and over the typical chameleon keeper journey, those are the major milestones and the decisions that you can make during those milestones 
that will have a huge effect as to how successful you are and how much you enjoy your chameleon keeping. And like I said at the beginning, it's very sad when you see people making the hard decisions and getting very frustrated. If we go back to the beginning, you get a wild-caught chameleon, you've got to go through so much acclimation, you've got to go to the vet, deparasitization, and all of that, number one, makes up for any savings you may have gotten by getting a cheaper wild-caught, and some chameleons just don't acclimate very well. If you're just starting off with chameleons, you don't want to go through that process. And so, no matter what stage you're at in your chameleon journey, if you are coming up to one of these milestones, I hope this episode gave you some insight into the best way to make that decision. There really are easier ways and harder ways. And when you're doing it the first time, I absolutely recommend doing it the easy way. Now, if you have any questions about these milestones that I've talked about, or if you have other decision points that you're wondering, is there an easy way, a better way and to avoid some hardship in the future? I invite you to join me on one of my live sessions. I have a live session on YouTube at 12 noon Pacific on Saturdays and a live session on Instagram Tuesdays at 5 p.m. Pacific. Of course, you can check the chameleonacademy.com website homepage for the latest schedule to make sure nothing's changed. I want to thank you very much for joining me here. It's a lot of fun talking chameleons and sharing experiences. This is Bill Strand signing off, and I'll see you next time.